Ladies, gents, welcome back. Random Gary here. Um, I've been away for a, a few days, hence the, the lack of videos. I actually made it back to Northern Ireland um, for a little trip, played a little bit of golf. I'm just back from the golf course this morning. I got a little bit wet, but I'm really concerned because I'm aware that there's a few big storms hitting America at the minute. So if you're in that area, please stay safe and and let us know how you're doing um today we're going to check out a, a medal of honor recipient uh, uh and the battle that stays with them forever um mental health's a big thing um guys coming back uh, guys and girls coming back and, and suffering um is a big deal um i'm i believe i believe that this is somebody who's who's put pen to paper and and spoke about their experiences so fingers crossed um, they're in a good place right now. Let's check out the video. On his third combat tour, Sergeant Clint Romache, by his own description, a tiny cog nestled deep inside the American war machine, earned the Medal of Honor for his actions in Afghanistan. I, I grew up in a family of, of military service. Uh, my grandfather was... Now sporting a full beard, he tells audiences wearing the medal is a burden. Uh, whenever he opened up with that, I don't think I've actually spoke about this before. I'm I'm fourth generation military on two separate branches um, of my family. Um, my my great grandfather was awarded the military medal. My my great uncle was um, he was part of the special air service in the, the Second World War. His brother was killed on the same night that he was captured and taken prisoner of war. Um, so you, you grew up with these stories about looking after people and, and just doing everything that you can for your buddies. Um, it's it's not war stories that you kind of grew up on. Well, it wasn't that I that I did. Um, so so you have this affinity, this this kind of want to do everything you can for your mates around you. These things aren't given out when something went right. A lot of stuff went wrong. So true. Um, so true. And, and it's a heavy weight at sometimes. Eight of his buddies were killed on the day in 2009 when he earned his medal defending an outpost in Afghanistan, which according to an army investigation had no tactical or strategic value. I think this is the case in a, a number of uh, places where you go into. If I'm honest, sometimes I think commanders want to be the people who set up a base in this place. They want to have that little tick on their, 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 their uh, tour report to say that they, they went into an area, they dominated it, they, they set up uh, a patrol base or a forward operating base. I've, I've been involved in a, a few getting established and ultimately I had the opinion that they afforded us nothing that we didn't have before. Now, seven years later, he's written a book about it. A saga whose characters are less heroic than one might wish. Exceptionally ordinary men who were put to an extraordinary test. Gallantry recipients are ordinary people who find themselves in extraordinary circumstances. I say that all the time. And the second thing I say is gallantry recipients it is not a reflection of how good they are. It only represents the opportunity they find themselves in. Anybody's capable of it very few actually have the opportunity for it. In a place called Combat Outpost Keating in a remote Afghan valley. No way. In Romache's words, the most remote, precarious, and tactically screwed combat outpost in all of Afghanistan. You never take the low ground. You always take the high ground. We're here doing this. This is, this is insane. This is what Keating looked like to the Taliban who were taking their own videos. When you went out on control of the high ground, you saw what the Taliban was seeing of key. Yes. That's way worse than anything I've been involved in. I mean, if, it, if, you, give, if you give a nine-year-old a load of uh, equipment and said, here, we, we want you to go and set up a military base, would they put it at the bottom of a valley that's that overlooked? I'd say no. I'd say absolutely not. What did it look like from the That's horrific. Point of view? At times, it looked like fish in a barrel. As an army sergeant, the only things Romache could control were the training of his men and their attitude, distilled in the motto, it doesn't get better. That was the mentality. Yeah, this sucks, but we can't control it. We can't affect it. 
Starting long before Romache's platoon arrived, the Taliban routinely fired, fired down on Keating from the heights. On average, this really annoys me. You know, really frustrates me. So what was the, uh, the purpose of those attacks? They were testing us to see what our battle plans were, how we would react, what our response times were. In my experience, the enemy were extremely effective at this year, and, and we had to almost interrupt and change up the way we would react because they were looking for patterns. They were, they were looking for our, our methods of defending places if we were static because there's not too many options for us. And we done things like instead of uh, getting people to stand up in the the, the, the sangers, um, we would get them to stand up on the walls. We would we would move around our our, our different weapon systems. We, sometimes we're calling mortars. Sometimes we're calling artillery. Other times it would be air. You're just you're so fixed. You're on their you're on their terms. And what you don't want to do is just become predictable. There were 52 American soldiers at the camp and six main fighting positions. The attack came at 5.59 in the morning of October 3rd, That's 2009. Horrific, it wasn't uncommon to get shot at at that time in the morning. Um, it was kind of like a wake-up call most mornings. But this morning was different, and it was all recorded by the Taliban. The Taliban had opened up on the six main fighting positions, pinning them down so they could not return fire. Keating sent out its first call for help three minutes after the attack began. You stand no chance if, if all of your defensive positions are overwatched, if the enemy has complete freedom of movement in and around that base. I don't, I don't care who you are, you just cannot, you just cannot defend your position you cannot keep the enemy at length they will be able to fix you they will be able to get up close this is if if you were the people making the strategic decisions that put these soldiers here shame on you that's all i can say shame on you fire coming from everywhere we need something soldiers not pinned down had to pull back from the perimeter to a cluster of buildings at the center of camp, which they called the Alamo position. And the call had kind of came out that we were still going to go to what we called the Alamo position. The Alamo position, that doesn't sound good. No. <laughs> so what did you think when you got the order? I really didn't like that idea. To me, it felt like we were giving up, that we were kind of waving the white flag and admitting defeat um, in that moment of time. When you pulled back into the Alamo position, you must have had to leave a bunch of guys out there. Yep. All the guys on the perimeter. Yeah, we knew we were leaving, you know, nine guys isolated on their own. This I hope he's in a I hope he's in a better place now, but we're we're seeing his, his lip trembling, the eyes. They're they're those stare through you eyes, aren't they? Um this is this is one of those occasions where I wish that the military would sometimes listen to the boots on the ground. He's a sergeant. He's an experienced bod. It sounds like they were all completely aware of how shitty a place this was. They called that position the Alamo position, man. Fucking last stand. Yeah, listen, listen. If you're ever in a position where you're strategically leading troops, listen to your troops. They, they know, they know what they're doing. They're, yeah. Um, which is a gut wrenching feeling to, to sit there and kind of have to call up another man and say, hey, you're going to have to hold on tight for a second. And we're hoping to get back to you, but this might be the last time we, we say anything across the radio. Romache came up with a desperate plan. Well, we can either sit here and he looks like a different person, die in our he? last final positions, or we can go out in a blaze of glory. He turned to Lieutenant Andrew Bunderman, the officer in charge. Told him we need to take this bitch back. That was the mission? Yes. Short and to the point. But then you got to get men to follow you out there. Yes. It's always a scary thing about being a leader. Were you sure they were going to follow? That's all I could do is ask. What happened when you asked for volunteers? Had five guys stand up. Didn't ask, what are we Effort. volunteering for? Didn't ask any of that. They just stood up. 
Amazing. Low on bullets, they first ran toward the front gate where their ammo dump was located. How close is the enemy? Um, closer than what I ever thought I'd, I'd see them, 10, 15 feet away. The Taliban were inside the camp's perimeter, and the command center sent out this chilling message. Enemy in the wire, enemy in the wire. One hour and 11 minutes into the attack, the first Apache helicopter gunships arrived overhead. Well, that's a long time to wait for AH. I, I, I don't know the circumstances, but that's, that's a long time to be calling for help before AH turns up. AH now has the added problem of the enemy are danger close to the troops. They're, they're going to need to get into the position where they can safely engage the enemy. Uh, and they'll have to be at a specific angle to prevent the rounds from from um, creating any danger for the, the friendly troops. And I imagine to do that, they'll need to be quite low. Um, they'll, they'll need to be um, pretty much over the top of the, the enemy position, making them also extremely vulnerable to those enemy troops that are that are up on the, the, the kind of uh, rooftops. This is this is all spawning off somebody deciding that there needed to be a base here. You've got you've got all of the troops in the base in danger. You've got all of the troops trying to support them are now completely in danger. You can't extract them. This is to find Keating in flames. Awful. Had they arrived five minutes later, Romache believes Keating would have been overrun. I just watched these three guys just walk on in like. My game was over. The, the fighting was already done. I mean, they just literally strolled on. They don't understand we're still here, we're still fighting. You know, their mistake. You're not going to just stroll in here like you own the place. Like you, you don't have a care in the world because we're about to make you care. The Apaches were followed by a B-1 bomber which leveled a village where much of the Taliban fire was coming from. How far was the uh, the village from, from where you were? It was less than 200 meters from their closest building to our perimeter. And they were dropping what kind of weapons? 500 pounders to 2,000 pounders. It seems awfully close. <laughs> it was. Um, you know, danger close for a 2,000 pounder is 1,000 meters. We would rather take our chances with our own bombs than, than be shot by the enemy. I'm glad he said uh, the splinter distance. So I've been within 1,000 meters of two 2,000 pounders going off. Um, I think I think explosions have this weird thing. So up to, up to 1,000 meters, the explosions get bigger and bigger. After 1,000 meters, as they get in closer and closer, I actually felt that the explosions look less impressive. But what does start to happen is instead of hearing a bang, you hear a crack, you feel the thump, you feel the overpressure. Um, to be 200 meters from that kind of thing going off is phenomenal. The, 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 the only thing that they had in their, in their kind of benefit was they were in a reinforced position. Um, and it, it sounds like it was easily identifiable from what looked like there on the map, an easily identifiable place where the B-1 was engaged. And the great thing with, with just having that single platform with huge munitions over the top is, is the second that it gets it right, you can let them know that, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly where you need to be and it's that same aircraft dropping again and again and again incredible incredible platforms lifesavers much like a10 much like ah go keep them in the sky finally this message went out keating reports negative contact with the enemy but seven americans lay dead and one stefan mace the platoon cut up was gravely wounded we finally had that medevac coming in and Mace was bagged up and ready to be put on it, still conscious. We all thought he was going to make it. I mean, that was a that was such a high moment with uh, everything that had happened. That Mace was going to make it. Sounds like at the end the battle came down to saving Private Mace. That's that's what we were all hoping for. So what happened? 
They attempted to do surgery on him, but it was just too late. You know, I think those medics did a whole lot for Mace, but I think it was Mace that held on to life for as long as he did until he left. Once he left his brothers, he knew he could go home. This battle was in 2009, right? Yes. So we're going on seven years. Oh, yeah. Still with you, isn't it? I hope it never leaves. Three years after the battle, Romache was awarded the Medal of Honor which struck him as both inappropriate and wrong. Yeah. L look at the body language, I think. To be fair, I think um, President Obama here is conscious of it. I think he's a very emotionally intelligent person, irrespective of what you think of him. I, I, I know he's a bit of a controversial kind of character to, to some people in the US. But to me, to me, he's there pretty much saying yeah, I understand you're uncomfortable, but you deserve this award. I think so. It boils down to why me? I didn't do anything special. Just did a job like 52 other guys there were doing that day and eight that did way more than I ever was asked of. I mean, why me? Because you were the one that led the counterattack. I think you could have replaced me with any other red-blooded American soldier. There would have been another one that would have stepped up and done the same thing. I'm British. After the battle, I'm all British. the soldiers were ordered to abandon Keating, and the outpost they had fought so desperately to defend was leveled by American bombs. Wow. Unreal. Um, guys... Um, I, uh, I don't hope you enjoyed that. I hope um, it may be. I hope it may be told a story of of somebody who you weren't aware of. Um, I hope it told you a story of some people who who made the ultimate sacrifice. I hope if you're ever going to be a strategic leader in the military, you listen to this and you take note. Um, for the the British guys watching in, I'm I'm going to grab um. I'm gonna grab a few uh, numbers, combat stress, PTSD resolution, anything like that. If you're struggling, hit those numbers, absolutely. American guys, if anybody has the same link for those numbers, put them in the comments below. I'll put them straight into the, the little subheading. Um, yeah, what, what an incredible young man. Um, I hope to see you all again very soon. Um, tough video, but all the best now.